Okay, I think we're good. Thank you very much. Uh, today, we at the uh, Alabama CubeSat Initiative have another spacecraft seminar series. Uh, this lecture is given by Michael Starch of JPL. Uh, Michael, please introduce yourself and take it away, sir. Sure. So, hi, I'm Michael Starch. I'm a flight software engineer at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. And I my day job is to manage the F prime flight software framework. And so today we're going to be going through the uh, flight software design presentation that talks a little bit about how to do designing of flight software. Um, I do well with questions, but I think the way this seminar is structured is that we'll save some of those questions for the end and that will uh, allow us to collect all of that information where we can get some good back and forth. So without much further ado, I'm going to jump right on in. So what are the key points that we want to take away from this seminar? Well, the, the first key point is to break down the software system into components and the interfaces between those components. We'll dive deeply into what this means, but essentially you have units of functionality called components and you have clearly defined interfaces that talk about how those things interact. That's a key piece. Note it and, and take it later. The next thing is to remember is design details like data life cycles, parallel execution, timeliness, and off-nominal conditions. These pieces need to be captured and remembered as you're designing the flight software. If you drop these details, you're going to run into problems as you test, and these details come crawling back out of the woodwork. So it's important that we maintain these details and speak to them as we walk through the design. And finally, we want to try to apply common design patterns. We're going to talk a lot about uh, some standard F prime design patterns, but we really want to apply design patterns to what we do because these patterns keep us structured around known ideas that have worked before. And so we'll dive into those design patterns later in the presentation. So what is our agenda today? We're going to talk about our software systems design. We're going to talk about our systems breakdown. We're going to talk about those design considerations that we um, mentioned. Then we're going to talk a little bit about modeling software in F-Prime. That's because F-Prime has certain constructs that map back to the rest of this presentation, and we want to call those out. And then we will focus specifically on some design patterns that are used with F-Prime. So as not to waste a lot of time, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into this material. So software systems design. The first thing I have to say about software systems design is everything you know is wrong. Um, software is a system. And when we think of systems, we break them down into subsystems and components that implement those subsystems. Software is no different. So when we look at software, we want to see how we can break it down. That is, we want units of software called components, and we want those networked into a system which we call a topology. It's essential to understand that topology before you design the components so that you understand how the system flows down into the individual units. And we see this in software all the time. Python uses composition of modules. That is, you import that module or you import this module. Java is fundamentally structured through class compositions. That is, you have this class, and it uses that class, and it uses the third class. And F prime uses these topologies. But each of these systems we talked about, Python or Java or F prime, all break their system down into these units things that we call components, and then network these components back into a system. So why, do it, why did I start off this talk by saying everything you know about software design is wrong? Well, because it is. In classes, in, you know, in our standard software classes, they tend to talk about a main function that breaks down into functions that call functions that call functions. Or they might have us do class diagrams. You have a class that has an intermediate class and subclasses hanging off that tree. This is all well and good when you want to talk about the structure of software, when you want to understand how software works together and you want to study it, study software as an entity, as a field. But when you actually want to apply software to solve a problem, this stuff doesn't really help. Functions and the table of contents method from main 
Class diagrams, they don't do well in capturing the functionality of your system. They capture the functionality of your software design, but not of the system as a whole. And what the point of this particular section of this seminar is to stress, we must capture the system as a whole. And so here's an example of what we've seen before. In actual code, you see these functions that call one another and pass arguments around. And we typically talk about the table of contents approach or the interacting services approach, which is these classes that register one another and call back and forth. But again, diagramming the, uh, the table of contents and diagramming the class architecture does not capture the system as a whole. Instead, we want to start with something like this. This is your standard whiteboard diagram. I like to start my systems diagramming and my system design by just drawing boxes on a whiteboard and drawing arrows. That's exactly what you see on this screen. It's simple. It does not convey the entire information of our system, but it gives us a starting place for discussion. And so, as you can see, we have a series of boxes here. We have a remote service, a communications driver, a manager service, and an application service, and they're wired together in this order. This is just a toy example, but right away we can see some properties of the system. It's broken down into services, it has a driver, it has managers of that driver, and then it has an application built on top. We can also see some of the communication flows. We see that the driver must communicate with the remote service, the manager uses the driver, and the application uses the manager. Right away, we can see how this system breaks down into its units that are talking to one another. This is a system topology. It might not convey all of the information about our interfaces, but as we work through this seminar, we will break those down and break out that information. What it conveys above that class diagram is interacting services, right? A class diagram might break down an individual one of these services, but it does not help us understand that service's place in the system as a whole. So what did we just describe? Well, we just described a web browser, which some of you might be using to view this context, this seminar. You can see our remote service was really a web server. Our TCP driver, uh, is what allows us to talk to that web server. We have an HTML service running that pulls out the data from TCP, and we have a UI service that renders that HTML. Very quickly, we were able to break down this web browser example into full services. Whereas if we just looked at the class diagrams that describe, say, Firefox, we may be lost as to how the whole system works together. This is why I said what we know of systems design or software design is wrong because it neglects, it often neglects the overall system to focus on how we design the individual components. But first we need to understand the system and how the parts fit together. So what is a more realistic example for our field? Here's an embedded systems example. We have an IMU component out there. That IMU is talked to with by, via an I squared C driver. The I squared C driver um, uses the IMU manager to interact with I squared C so that IMU is managed via I squared C. And then we have a commanding service that commands that IMU manager and an event service that rolls up all the events. This is pretty standard in um, the F prime world, we know this as the application manager driver pattern, where you have an application like a command service commanding a manager that manages a subsystem, in this case, the I squared C, and then that manager delegates to the driver. What we see here is a snippet of system topology that gives us a lot of insight into how the system functions. We can see that the manager talks to the I squared C driver, talks to the IMU, etc. So now you can see why starting with these whiteboard diagrams where we've broken out core functionality, the boxes, and network them with arrows that see, show how they talk together gives us insight into the software design. We see not only a component that we want to talk about designing, like the IMU manager, but we also see the components nearby that it has to interact with. And the key piece of this lecture is we're going to start with a diagram like this and break down the individual contracts between these components so that we have a full system design. You can see these arrows that go back and forth here. Each one of these arrows shows us 
on our whiteboard where the interfaces are. There's an interface between the IMU manager and the I2C driver. There's an interface between the IMU, the remote hardware, and the I2C driver. There are interfaces between the IMU manager, the event service, and the command service and the IMU manager. Each of these interfaces needs to be reckoned with, understood, and designed. Any questions so far? Okay. Next thing is to break down the system. This was the point number one of the seminar. The first takeaway is that we have to start with this system's design and break down each of these pieces to get a full understanding of the system and well-designed software. We start with that whiteboard diagram, but then piece by piece, we must break down those components. The components we see on this you know, jotted down whiteboard diagram that I might have drawn on my whiteboard in my office need to be broken down into full component designs. So let's talk a little bit about how to do that. One, we already know that a topology is the composition of these components and the connections between these components. Designing the topology, at least an initial first pass of the topology, that is the network of components in your system, gives you a set of components and the connections between those components. We want to identify the system components so that we understand what pieces make up our system. What boxes do we need for a complete running system? And we need to identify the connections between those components because those connections represent the interfaces between components. And those interfaces are the contracts that those components use to work with one another. We'll get more into the interfaces in just a moment. What we did on our whiteboard was to sit, sketch that software topology and the component interactions so that we have an understanding of how to start breaking down the system. We have the whiteboard diagram, and now we can go piece by piece, interaction between, by interaction, and break out our components and our interfaces. So what are some examples of this? Well, we showed in our last diagram that we had a motor controller that needed to talk to an I2C manager, which to talk to an I2C driver, which talked to some remote hardware. If we have a radio subsystem or a communication subsystem in our uh, larger topology, we do the same thing. We have a radio component, which talks to a radio manager, which talks to the, the radio communications driver, be it SPI or something else, and then that talks to the physical hardware. As you can see, we're taking that whiteboard diagram and formalizing it just a little bit to call out the pieces that make up our topology and the specific interactions between them. Next, we want to talk about interface design. Here, we want to make sure to understand how the components in our system topology talk to one another. If I have a motor controller and it needs to control a motor using I squared C, that motor controller must talk to the I squared C driver. So far, we've been calling it the, uh, um, We've also talked about the IMU. Sorry, the IMU manager must also talk to the I squared C bus. As you can see, each of the components in our overall design have interfaces with other components. An interface is a contract. It says my component will obey these behaviors and expose these functions to you, some remote components. If these interfaces aren't well specified, then it becomes very difficult to design a system as a sum of parts because the parts don't necessarily know how to interact with one another. Thus, we need to make sure that these interfaces are well specified. So we need to talk about what functionality is exposed by a given component, that is the interface. We also wanna make sure that we understand the protocol that is exposed over that interface. The protocol you use to talk to say some hardware driver is going to be very different than the protocol you use to talk between F prime components. These interfaces also have to manage the exchange of data, right? You have data flowing between these components. You have to understand how that data flows between components. We'll see that more of this later. So what are some examples? The event manager uses F prime packets to talk to the radio via a port call. So here, port call is that protocol. It's an F prime port call. And we specified the data type that runs across it, also known as F prime packets. 
A radio manager might send byte data via an SPI driver to actually control the hardware. So here we have a different type of interface, but it's an interface nonetheless. The protocol is um, the SPI protocol as specified in the Linux SPI headers or your operating systems SPI headers, and the data that we're sending is byte data. So now we've seen F prime has its protocol and its data types. A radio has its data types and the SPI subsystem in your OS has um, that protocol. And then we have yet another interface, which is the SPI driver and hardware interface, where you might have certain registers that you have to poke in order to transmit those SPI bytes. At each stage, at each example, we see a clear interface. This must interact with this using this protocol and sending this data type. So we've gone from the system where we've broken down components, and now we've taken those components and we've started saying they interact with the other parts of this system through interfaces that specify protocol and data type. Any questions here? Okay. The last thing we have to remember before we leave interfaces is data ownership. As you send data across these various protocols, who owns the data? What happens when somebody in this chain wants to change that data, alter what the data looks like, update that data? Who has ownership of the data and who's allowed to create and destroy that data? We'll talk about data life cycles towards the end of this presentation. So here we are at component design. When we're designing components, they have to implement a set of these interfaces that we've just talked about. So you want to implement a set of interfaces, you want to execute uh, within a particular context, and you want to understand when I produce, consume, and manage data. That's what we're focusing on with regard to the specific component design. You need to identify what interfaces are going to be implemented. Certainly, you're not just going to inter in implement one interface for a component. In F prime lingo, that would be using a single port. For example, our IMU manager needs to have multiple ports because it reads I squared C, but it also writes to I squared C and it executes against the event dispatcher to be able to send events across the wire. So now we've identified at least three different interfaces that this component must implement. It has to know how to write I squared C, read I squared C, and send events, and possibly others. We also want to understand the execution context. Components, especially in F prime, can be active, they can be queued or they can be passive. In an active component, you have a thread that executes. You need to understand that thread's lifecycle and how messages get to and from that thread to be processed. For the other two types of components, queues, queued, and passive, they need to be granted execution context. That is, some other component in the system must say, it is your turn to run now, please run. If you're not understanding the execution context of your component, then you're likely not going to give it an execution context when it needs one, or you're likely going to start running into thread, um, uh, thread deadlocking problems where the execution context competes with another execution context. So as we look at component design, we need to understand where its execution context is coming from, whether it's from the caller, from a thread or from an ISR. And we need to make sure that the behaviors that we design into this component respect that execution context. Lastly, we need to understand shared data. We talked about producing, consuming, and managing data. And that's all fine if it's internal to your component, not a lot has to be done there. But if your data is going to leave the component or be shared with the larger system, you've now opened up the box and that data begins to flow between components. And now we need to understand ownership of that data. The easiest way to run into data corruption issues and um, uh, buffer overflows and that sort of thing in C++ and other languages is to not understand how your shared data works. Who owns the shared data in any context? That is, if I create shared data and then I 
destroy that shared data is somebody else trying to use it after it's been destroyed. I ran into this exact problem outside of the world of embedded software this weekend. I was working with Python that was wrapping some bindings around some C++ objects, and I created an object, read data out of it, and then let it be destroyed immediately. What I didn't realize is under the hood, that data that I read out of it was actually a reference. And when my original object was destroyed, it got entirely flattened. And my usage of that data that I had pulled out stopped working. I started getting assertions saying, hey, this data object was destroyed. I scratched my head a little bit and then realized, wait a minute, I didn't reckon with the shared data of the component that I was working with. I asked for some shared data, but I did not make sure that that data's life cycle was understood. And therefore I ran into a problem where I was using data that had already been destroyed because I had destroyed its owning object and not transferred ownership. This is exactly how problems arise also in, in the world of embedded systems. If you don't respect the data's life cycle or you don't properly transfer ownership, you will try to use data that you do not own and run into uh, double free problems, um, data already being uh, destroyed problems. All of these things that we dread in C++ arise from the fact that we're not properly handling ownership. Components, and the data that they manage own that data until they transfer it out. And once it's transferred out, the receiver of that ownership owns it until transferred back. If you do not respect this, you will run into problems. If you respect this life cycle, you will not. And we'll, we'll talk more about data life cycle in a future slide. So uh, here are some examples of component design. The, as we talked about, the IMU manager might have an I squared C and an I squared or a write to talk to that I squared C driver. It executes on the caller's thread, so that means it's a passive component and it inherits its context of execution from the caller. What does this mean in terms of design? It means the caller has to understand that it's doing I squared C transactions as soon as it calls into this IMU manager. It also means that the IMU manager is not going to take up a system's thread. Another example is the TCP driver using Berkeley sockets to interact with the IP stack on a dedicated read thread. This is what we see in our ground uh, TCP driver. It has a dedicated thread that it uses. So we don't have to worry about blocking some caller when we're working with this pattern. We also see that it's interacting via the uh, Berkeley sockets interface to interact with the operating system's IP stack. You can see these little snippets represent these concepts in component design. Each component has a set of interfaces. They have a con uh, context they operate on. And again, we'll talk about data more momentarily. So here's the data and ownership slide. Before we dive in, are there any questions thus far? OK. I keep asking for questions, but I also told you to hold them till the end. So I'm sure we'll get lots when we get to the end, but that's okay. It's It's been a really clear and uh, thought-provoking seminar so far. So thank okay. you for that. Uh, but no, no questions so, yet. Cool. All right. Data and ownership. I just gave an example of how not respecting data ownership can cause errors that cause you to scratch my head, uh, scratch your head or mine. I was working with objects that returned data references but did not transfer ownership to me. Then I blew those objects away and wondered why my data wasn't available. Fortunately, the underlying library was written in a way where it provided asserts that warned me as to what was going on, as opposed to just segmentation faults that break and me wondering why did the thing seg fault I'm writing in Python. Data and ownership is important. If we do not un identify the data we need to share between components, then we cannot have a system that shares data between the components in a safe manner. So first, in order to handle data and ownership, we have to identify what data is shared between components, right? A component that has certain amounts of internal state that nobody else gets to see doesn't have to worry about data sharing problems. It owns all its data, that data never leaks outside the boundaries of its box, and it all is well and good. But it doesn't really come into the um, 
realm of uh, the breakdown that we're talking about because that data doesn't leave the box. We're talking about data that does leave the box. You have data that you need to send to another component. You have data that you need to send to a global context. You need to understand what data leaves your component and goes to another component or is used by another component in the system. We need to establish how that shared data is allocated, exchanged, and deallocated. This is the data life cycle that I've been talking about. At some point, you go out there and create data. You get some memory for it. You populate that memory. That's the allocation. At some point, you exchange that data with others, and they get to use that data, read that data, interact with that data. And then at some point, you deallocate that data. You, that is, you destroy the data. You need to make sure that the allocation, the exchange, the usage, and the deallocation happen in a way that you don't run into the problem I ran into this weekend, which was I used data after it was deallocated. That's bad. That can crash a spacecraft. You want to make sure that that does not happen. And so as you start to reckon with this data, make sure you understand the flow of ownership. Trace that data from where it's created through who uses it back to where it's destroyed and make sure that the ownership is transferred at each stage. That is, at each time we must designate the owner of shared data and make sure that owner is the only one who has access to the data, is using the data, and that no other data, uh, no other owner or no other component tries to do things that an owner should do, like say, destroy the data. And then also, you must understand what happens to that data in off nominal conditions. I allocated for some data, I exchanged it with another component, and that other component crashed. What happens to the data ownership in this case? Let's say I wanted to send a buffer to a driver. I send it to the driver and the driver doesn't open. It fails to get the hardware resource. What happens to my data in this off nominal scenario? Does the data get destroyed by the driver? Does it get returned to the allocator and then destroyed? Or does it just kind of represent a data leak in my system because I didn't think about this off nominal condition? Not only do we have to think about the full life cycle, but we need to think about places where the life cycle might break down because some other error and make sure that the life cycle both respects ownership and ends in deallocation. So here are some examples of thinking through data ownership. The framer component in F-Prime allocates memory buffer via the buffer manager. That's the allocation step. It receives the ownership of that shared buffer from the buffer manager. So now the allocator, that is the buffer manager, does not own that buffer anymore. It has transferred ownership to our framer. It is not allowed to deallocate that buffer until that buffer is uh, transferred back, the ownership is transferred back to the buffer manager itself. Next step, the framer delegates ownership of this buffer that it got from the buffer manager to the IPv4 driver via a port call. So now the framer is not allowed to alter this data or attempt the out to deallocate it because it's transferred ownership to the next component. The IPv4, the IPv4 component delegates ownership back to the buffer manager such that the buffer can be deallocated. Notice we formed a chain. Buffer manager starts with the allocation. Framer gets the first transfer ownership and it alters the data by editing some of the byte buffers underneath. Then that data is transferred again to the IPv4 driver. At each of these uh, specific transfers, which in F prime is a port call, we make sure that ownership is transferred and the person who had, or the component that had ownership isn't allowed to do anything anymore until it gets ownership back. The buffer manager is allowed to deallocate the buffer. It owns the buffer pool, so therefore it must do the deallocation, but it is not allowed to deallocate until that ownership is transferred back to it. And in this way, we protect our data. At any given time, we only have one owner of the data and nobody else is trying to do something with that data until ownership is transferred or delegated back. We didn't talk too much about uh, off nominal conditions in, in this case, but we can imagine um, if the IPv4 driver encounters a fault, it is still responsible for transferring that buffer 
used or otherwise back to the buffer manager for deallocation. If the framer it runs into a fault. That is, it has too much to frame and it doesn't fit in the buffer. The framer just can't leak that data from the buffer manager because then we've lost access to that memory. It must also transfer the buffer either to the IPv4 driver and then to deallocation or transfer it directly to deallocation itself. If it doesn't handle these off nominal conditions, we will run into an issue where we leak memory. All right, moving forward. Off nominal conditions. So we've already started to see how off nominal conditions start to influence our design. We have to have the design in place to handle off nominal conditions. So to formalize that bit of design a little bit, we need to identify places where non-standard conditions can occur. We need to understand the severity of those conditions and we have to identify an appropriate response. In the case of some of the errors we've talked about already, the off nominal condition is, oh, we ran out of memory in this buffer. The severity is, well, we know we have to get it to back to the buffer deallocator and make sure that that buffer doesn't leak. But the severity, you, know, you could argue that it's pretty severe because we're dropping packets going to the ground, or you could argue it's less severe. That's part of the design process. That's something your project has to reckon with. But you can see that for each of these things, we need to identify where it can happen, how bad is it, and what is the appropriate response. Some examples will help us understand this a little bit more. So what happens in a hardware failure? Well, most of the time we say go to safe mode. Um, so on the case of the hardware failure, our appropriate response is go to safe mode. And the severity is... Eh, it's the severity of go to safe mode. It's not the, hey, this is a fatal, we have to reboot the spacecraft now severity, but it's also not the severity, hey, this is okay, we just keep operating as business as usual. Another good example, malformed user input or data comes in. What is the appropriate response? Well, it's probably warning severity. Again, your software should not fault on malformed input, but you want to emit a warning because that's a fairly severe condition and you want to keep processing um, as normal. And then a final example, this is the big one, the one that has uh, massive severity, which is memory inconsistency. You've detected that a bit flipped in memory. This is a fatal severity. Software should not continue to execute if the memory that the software is reliant on is inconsistent. What happens? We identify it as a fatal severity and we do a full system reset and memory scrub. Why? Because if your software is based on the wrong values in memory, no good behavior can result and your job is to reset and scrub memory as soon as possible. So here we see multiple levels of severity, safe mode, or just print a warning, or full reset. We've identified where they can happen, memory, bad user input, hardware failure, and we've identified the appropriate response. This brings us to the end of our systems breakdown. As you can see, we broke down the full system into interfaces, components, and then we talked about data life cycles between those components and the off nominal conditions that happen as those components interact with one another. So we're going to talk a little bit about flight software design considerations, but are there any questions or things you'd like to explore a little bit more before we continue? Hey, Michael, I had a, a question about the, the severity identified on that last slide. Sure. Uh, so for the missions that you've been a part of, are the severity levels that you've identified generally the same for each mission or close to the same? Can they be standardized in a way? Or is this for every mission, design it from the ground up, determine what it should be for this bespoke system? So the answer is yes and yes. So if you look in terms of the F prime EVR stack, there's a set of standard severities, activity high, activity low, warning high, warning low, fatal. And so for off nominal conditions that occur in F prime components that typically just result in a uh, EVR being published, those severities are pretty standard. Um, for each of those levels I just mentioned, I can tell you exactly where to use them. And I can tell you that a fatal EVR results in a system reset. 
um, or typically it, it, it invokes a fatal handler, which usually resets the system. Now, that's EVRs, that's system logging severity that handles basic errors. But there are other types of errors that are system level errors, right? Hey, I failed to open this hardware device. Hey, this umbrella failed to deploy. Hey, uh, this component seems to be inoperative. Those typically get relegated to a fault handling system. So we're not talking about individual component faults, but faults that affect the whole system. And those whole system faults tend to be pretty bespoke. You decide what are the behaviors when fault X, Y, or Z happens, and usually you enumerate those faults. Hey, I failed to uh, open this device. Hey, I failed to do this thing. Those are the system level faults that are bespoke. Now, in general, system level faults um, are enumerated, but you usually have the same typical faults hanging or typical responses hanging around. Safe mode. Usually in my systems, if anything goes wrong, we just say go to safe mode and wait for input. Does that make sense? If something very severe goes wrong, we reset, go to safe mode and wait for input. And so at the component level, if it's something that just affects your component, they're pretty well binned. And they should be because you don't want your component taking bespoke behavior. But things that a component can't handle itself in terms of the fault stack get emit to, emitted to the system level, the system fault management. And the system fault management you, is entirely defined by the project, but tends to follow typical patterns usually around what the institution is used to doing. And those are things like safe mode or reset and safe mode. Does that answer your question? It, it does. That was really thorough. To, to follow up and make sure I understand, we should be putting our, uh, our, our bespoke behavior or custom design into the fault handler and fatal handler, but we should not be creating new... Uh, types of warnings. So you said that we there's in the the F prime state you have uh, warning high and warning low. Should we be creating warning medium if it suits our needs, or just put that into uh, corresponding to the enumeration of the faults in say the the fault or fatal handler? Uh, I would not create a warning medium if it were me. One, because I don't think it's easily possible without rewriting swaths of the system. And two, because it, it breaks you from standard norms. You want your project that you're flying today to look at, look like the project that's flying next week. So if you have bespoke behaviors, that is uh, resolutions to these faults, you can put them in, right? If your component says, oh, I failed to open the hardware device and the correct response is retry, well, put that in your component. That's entirely isolated. I wouldn't create a warning medium for that. I would choose either warning low, that is something bad happened, but we're probably okay. And warning high, which is, hey, something bad happened and somebody probably should see this, but we're gonna keep running rather than fall out of the sky. You're right, those are your kind of choices uh, in terms of how to log the warning. But resolution, you can do whatever you need to do, both inside the component and outside the component. And I think I might have muddied those lines a little bit. Um, does that help, or or should I elaborate a little bit more? This no, this has been great. Um, are, are there any other questions from the the students on this topic? These students may have already been working with the uh, the F prime uh, the fatal handlers um, for a while now, but. Okay. It, it's still very helpful. So if we have more questions on how to handle off nominal conditions and how to design through this, let's talk in the questions section at the end. For now, let's talk a little bit about some of the other considerations to talk about when we talk about this design. So we just talked about how to break down the system and the, con the primary concerns when you're breaking things down. What are our interfaces? What data is going over those interfaces and being shared? And what is our off nominal conditions? What are our off nominal conditions? The next question is, what other considerations do we have? So let's walk through some of those. One, set up an initialization. When you're working with resources in a system, especially a spacecraft system, you don't want to do risky things mid-flight, right? You want to get to a steady state and then run at this steady state. So finite resources are allocated, and that allocation, that initialization, uh, 
should happen at the beginning of your software. This is to reduce risk. So anytime you need a resource, this is like a RAM, This is that is memory, um, that is new or allocations of memory. Anytime you need a thread, that is, you know, a new, that's an allocation at the operating system level. And anytime you need a critical file, that is a file that must exist or you cannot do your job, these things, have risk when you try to open them. If you try to get more RAM and there's not enough memory available, what do you do? If it's critical memory, you're in trouble. What happens if you try to get a new thread and suddenly that thread bogs the system down or you don't have enough thread uh, identifiers to be able to manage it at the operating system level? What do you do when you try to allocate a critical file and there's no space left on disk? This is the risk we're talking about here. All of this risk should be pushed towards initialization. That means when you're designing components that need to access these kinds of resources, uh, memory, threads, critical files, anything that puts an extra burden on the operating system or on the uh, processing system, you should do that at startup. What does that mean? That means we're allocating memory pools at the beginning and delegating portions of that pool off when we need to allocate dynamic memory during runtime. It means we are pre-allocating every single one of our threads that we need and just not running much on those threads until they're actually alive and running. But we've pre-allocated these resources so that once the system is up and stable, these things exist. It also means that you are allocating critical files at startup. So let's say you have a database file that has four entries in it and you need those four entries. Pre-allocate it at startup and fill it with those four entries, even if they're not going to be used. This means when you go to use them, that file exists and you're not gonna run into out of memory, out of disk space, out of threads, when you, when you get to the point of needing them and have a random crash in your software, you know, six months down the line. Instead, you're gonna run into these problems at initialization and likely at initialization while it's sitting in the test bed um, and you can do something about it as opposed to, well, we engaged this behavior in space, it allocated four new threads, ran out of threads and the spacecraft didn't work anymore. This idea of pre-allocating, um, doing allocations of resources at initialization has some other implications. The biggest one is don't use recursion. We hear all the time, why don't we use recursion in embedded systems, in spacecraft software? Well, we don't use recursion because people tell us not to use recursion. But really what is happening is when you recurse through a function, you are allocating new stack frames that grow indefinitely. So effectively, you are allocating stack space Sorry, I should clarify. You are allocating unbound stack space in the middle of your program as opposed to it initialization. That's why we unwind uh, recursion into iterative for loops because it doesn't have this runaway problem of allocating lots of stack frames, which could cause you to run out of stack mid execution. Much better, it is much better to stay within your standard function calls that allocate a reasonably fixed amount of stack and don't have this runaway stack explosion that causes um, these kinds of problems. This also means that when you are working in something like F prime, you should be using buffer manager patterns. That is something that allocates the necessary uh, memory at startup and doles it out to components that need it during runtime. You should be using file managers that help manage your critical files and you should make sure to design your system so that these unpredictable resource allocating requests, whatever they might be, are pushed to the beginning at initialization and then managed for the life cycle of the program so that your software never allocates something unexpected in a way that would cause a fault. Next, we need to talk about execution, concurrency, and threads. Synchronous execution, that is execution that happens linearly, happens on the caller's thread. So you need to understand where this execution context is coming from and how it affects the caller. If I have a 
component that calls it a passive component that is synchronous execution, all the time it takes to do that work um, is done on my thread during that function call. I need to understand that as part of my system design because I certainly don't want to do an expensive operation on that call and block the entire stack. We see this quite often in F prime. If a component runs an expensive operation on say a command handler and it's passive, we've suddenly bogged down the command handler so that it cannot process commands anymore. This can be a, a problem. Parallel execution, on the other hand, has multiple threads, but it means you run into this data ownership problem because now you are transferring data between multiple threads and you need to make sure that that ownership is transferred along with it. Synchronous execution, the transfer of that data is just, hey, it went down to the function call and I'm blocking on that function call. Therefore, the data is still kind of owned by me and I've delegated it to this function. When you're passing data through queues between threads, you need now need to manage this ownership. If I send my data to a queue, I don't own that data anymore until some event in the future processes that data and data comes back. So data sharing across contexts requires either locking of data so that multiple people aren't editing it or queues and understanding that when I put my data on a queue, I can't alter it or destroy it until that queue has processed. What you want to avoid is ships passing in the night. That is two threads are operating at the same time and they try to do something and the calls both end up blocked on somebody else's queue. And then they say, well, we're both gonna execute. And now something that should have been managed is executing in two contexts without realizing that the other one queued up a message. What does this imply? This implies that concurrency, threading, synchronicity, uh, in if, um, system interrupts, they must be planned. You must have to understand how your components interact with one another in thread space and in execution space so that data is handled properly, ownership is handled properly, and that data transfers along as you expect. Shared resources also must fall into this category. As you think through threads, what data and what resources are being shared and how does that bubble up to your concurrency model? You must may, uh, understand how messaging and scheduling happens in this context. Um, when messages are being processed on queues, there is some non-negligible time that that message will sit on the queue, and you need to understand that so that a critical message doesn't block on a queue sitting there waiting to be processed. And then, of course, you also have to take good care when dealing with specific timing. Timeliness is another issue that comes in. If you say start this uh, action and put that start action message on a queue and it sits there for 10 minutes while the queue processed, you're not really being very timely anymore. You have this 10 second jitter. So you have to understand how to make sure that timeliness and deadlines are respected in this model. Which brings us to deadlines and timeliness. Some processes in our system have very specific deadlines. I once saw this on a temperature and humidity sensor uh, that I was working with, and it had a start message. And then exactly 10 microseconds later, you had to send a stop message. In fact, it was turning a, a line high and then turning a line low. That component would not operate if there was more than some very small amount of error in this 10 millisecond pulse. It just wouldn't function. Therefore, it had a very specific timeliness that I had to respect. I was trying to write to it via Python, and Python is not a very timely language. In fact, the time between commands in Python can be more than 10 microseconds. So it was a challenge to respect this device's timeliness with the language that I chose. If we look at our systems, we have to be able to respect the timeliness of the hardware and other system properties that we have. Um, we have to respect this timeliness with respect to the rest of the system. That is the language choice, um, the threading model, et cetera. How do we do that? Well, we first have to identify the tasks that require strict timing, right? There are certain pieces of our system that require strict timing, like say stro stroking your watchdog to make sure that the hardware knows that the software is still up and make sure that those 
uh, pieces are designated for strict deadlines. We also should identify active processing, that's stuff we want to happen that may not have strict timing, but should occur in the foreground and pr proceed with reasonable efficiency. That is something like a command dispatch. And then there's background processing, stuff that can just burn the processor for as long as it takes. That's stuff like opening up files. Once we've identified these categories, strict timing, active processing, background processing, we need to make sure to handle them appropriately. What is the implications of this? Well, non-time sensitive work should be put on low priority background tasks. We see this in the file manager pattern where we have a specific component to manage file accesses in our software. And it goes off and says, all right, I'm gonna read this file and I'm not gonna to respond to the caller until I'm done. That allows the calling component, which isn't dealing with the files to sit there and do other things, respond to active processing like command dispatches and handle real deadlines without being how would we say, slowed down by the file processing, while this other component on the background thread reads the files, and when it's done, it reports back via callback saying, hey, file is ready. Now you can do your work. In this way, we've taken critical processing, and it is time-sensitive and um, active processing, and separated it from the background processing. It also means that critical work without specific deadlines should uh, operate in your middle priority tier. We've talked about the background tier, that's slow background stuff, reading files, scrubbing memory, et cetera. Stuff like command processing that doesn't have a strict deadline, but still needs to be taken care of in a reasonable amount of time, that operates in your middle priority tier. That is the threads with medium priority in your prioritization scheme. This makes sure that the active parts of the system I keep returning to command dispatching, but really command dispatching, those keep moving forward. You don't block the command dispatcher or command sequencing or the operations of the spacecraft that uh, because uh, you've put this stuff on a background thread. And then finally, the highest priority tasks, that is the highest priority threads, manage the deadlines and critical work that happens on a clock. If you look at an organization of a normal F prime system, the highest th priority threads in the system are your rate groups because the rate groups dispatch clock messages so that things can happen on a fixed deadline, on a fixed clock. They're the highest priority because you don't want anything else in the system, command dispatching, file processing, nothing to disrupt that deadline-based processing that you have. Any questions here? I hope you're able to see how we segmented the regions of thread processing, background on the low priority threads, active processing in the medium threads, and then deadline driven processing at the highest priority threads. All right, the last design consideration we have stems right out of, out of off nominal handling. And we talked a little bit about this already, but we need to identify what faults can occur what fatals can occur, and what error handling we're going to do when we're designing our components and when we're designing our system. Specifically, flight software is expected to protect your spacecraft, and that means it's running at all times. If your flight software goes down, your hardware is operating without a brain, and who knows what it's going to do. It's a safety concern for your hardware if software suddenly goes down. So we don't want to operate in a context where flight software isn't executing for a long time. Yeah, we can reboot the flight software every once in a while, but in general, flight software needs to stay up and it needs to stay stable. This implies that when you're designing your software, you need to handle all of those off nominal conditions and make sure that they're properly handled in a way that doesn't cause uh, what we see on the right-hand side, an uncontrolled reboot or crash, because an uncontrolled reboot or crash means you lost control. So what are faults? Faults are things that happen in the system that you did not expect and need to be resolved. So your component might have faults that it reports via the event handling log and manages internally. More importantly, your system might have faults where you have to do full on fault handling. And we talked about this at the systems level, you have a fault manager that will handle the appropriate response to faults. 
the canonical one is go to safe mode. Any fault that happens that we don't know anything about it, go to safe mode. But you can see how these off nominal conditions have a handler at the system level and when needed at the component level um, to be processed. Fatals are a special type of fault and a special way of triggering them through a fatal event log, which causes the system to reboot. So where most faults can be handled, fatals cause a software reboot. And these happen in two cases that I know of. One, memory inconsistency. That is, like we already talked about, the memory is not consistent with itself, and therefore the software execution is probably also inconsistent. The other type of fatal that I see a lot is assert failures. That is, some assertion in the software that said the software must meet this precondition um, failed, which means your software either wasn't written correctly or your software has done something that the designer did not think was possible, at which point you should probably be re rebooting because the behavior of the software cannot be trusted. The recurring theme here is fatals tend to happen when the behavior of the software itself cannot be trusted, either because of memory corruption or because the uh, preconditions of the software don't match when they're expected to. The other thing that we need to know about um, this off nominals is that th these things occur. It does not matter how good your software is or how much you've designed the system, something unexpected will go wrong. How did I run into this problem where I had this memory fault that we've been talking about uh, in Python? Well, it's because I combined two lines in uh, example code that from a Python perspective were natural to combine, but it resulted in an unanticipated deallocation. No amount of software design would have saved me from this problem because I was trying to implement good programming practice by reducing redundant variables, but I still ran into an off nominal condition. This happens in your spacecraft all the time. Something will go wrong. Some hardware won't deploy, some bit will get flipped. And so you must respect that it will happen and deal with it. And finally, your operators need to understand what's going on. So when you've controlled your reboots and your crashes, when you've decided to reboot the system because of a failure, logging is critical. You must log your off nominal conditions. We talked about this a little bit already. We have fatals that are an event type that get logged. We have warnings that are an event type that get logged. But the key piece here is each of these off nominal conditions results in some log message that somebody on the ground can look at and um, respond to at some point in the future. The final implication is the reason why we don't want an uncontrolled reboot or crash. And that is because the spacecraft should be made safe before loss of control happens. So when you're looking at these off nominal conditions, you don't want to crash. You don't want the software to just give up. We have an assert handler in place so that if we break a software precondition, we still have an option to do something before the spacecraft shuts down or reboots. Think of it this way. Your spacecraft is firing a laser, which some spacecraft do. Do you really want that laser firing when the software isn't even able to control that laser? That is, turn it off if it's pointed at something delicate or turn it off when it's about to overheat. The answer is absolutely not. We don't want things that are dangerous to the spacecraft happening in an uncontrolled fashion. Therefore, we collect, respond to, and manage the state of the spacecraft with response to faults before we take any drastic action like rebooting. Whereas a crash of the software has the opposite effect. No handling and no mitigation is done before the spacecraft just goes up or, or before the software goes down. All of these things have to be considered when you're designing your software. So to maintain that safe um, state of the spacecraft in the case of an unanticipated uh, condition. All right. I threw in a slide about data serialization and uh, deserialization. This is just something that we have to consider when we're working with software. It's a little bit different than the other design principles, but it's something that you have to understand. When you're sending data to and fro across a wire, you need to understand how that data is going to be persisted to the medium between the two components. So 
If you're in RAM, for example, your data might be padded. Lots of compilers like to pad data in RAM. When you're serializing it to a wire, as you can see in this bottom corner, it may not be padded anymore. So a raw data copy to a buffer and a raw data copy out of a buffer might not work as you expect. Bytes in RAM may have different orders than the order on the opposite side of this interface that you're sending the data across. Therefore, you need to make sure to understand how the data is going to the wire, how it's coming back from the wire, and is it being reconstructed in a way that makes sense to the other side. Specifically, we see this when sending data between processors. Data in processor one might be little endian, processor two might be big endian, and if you were to just copy the data to the wire and then read it back, you'd get the wrong result because those byte orders flop. And so when we're working with uh, data serialization, we need to understand this and make sure that the data is going to be serialized and then deserialized, that is put to disk and reconstructed in a way that makes sense to both nodes, one on each side. All right. Any questions here? Otherwise, we're going to talk a little bit about modeling some of the design constructs that uh, we've talked about um, in F prime. Ooh, we're already at an hour. Um, so my question to you all is, should I keep going at this pace uh, or should I um, move forward so we can get to the questions section? You're you're good. If we've got questions, uh, the students can ask them at any point in time. There's also a Q&A section where they can type the questions out. And so even if they type it and they have to leave, we can ask it's the questions at the end and, and see the recording. Uh, please continue. OK, cool. All right. So we talked about designing topologies and breaking down topologies. So what are topologies? They are a network of components. They and in F prime, a topology contains instantiations of components. So we write a component class, but we can instantiate that component multiple times. We can see this in our reference application that ships with F prime. We have a signal generator component and we have four instances in the topology. That is, we can reuse these components multiple times in the topology and get a unique instance um, of each. A topology itself in F prime lists the component instances and the connections between those components. So that's how we take these ports, which are our interfaces, and connect them together to form the whole system, which is an interconnected set of topologies. Ports, we model by defining the ports type. Remember, this is one little bit of the component's full interface. It's an individual um, connection and it represents the interface that components talk to one another over. These ports, in a, when um, designed in a topology, represent a point-to-point -point network. That is, each port connects to another port. Ports can have arguments with specific types, and these arguments allow data to transfer between the individual components of the system. Ports may have return values, but these return values uh, are only useful in the case that the port is a synchronous call. If it's an asynchronous connection that goes through a queue, you can't actually return data from that because there is no return path. Your message has been put on a queue for later processing. And so you can see here that we have a little example of how you might model a port. We designed a little data type, uh, which is a struct, and then we put that struct as a return type from the port. Components. Components represent the concrete um, function of the system. We've already talked about how we can break our components, our system down into individual components and those interfaces, and the component lists out those interfaces that it, it um, agrees to. So you can see on the right-hand side, we're not just implementing one port, but this component has multiple ports that it deals with, along with some commands and some events, et cetera. I'm mistaken. The component only has one port, but it just as well could have multiple ports. It does have multiple interfaces because it defines some commands and events, which are specialized uh, data types. Uh, our components come in three types, active, passive, queued. Active components have a thread. Passive components and queued components require context from somebody else to execute. And finally, these components interact with one another via these ports. We've talked a lot about this in our seminar so far. 
All right, so that was a little bit about the modeling. You saw brief snippets of the FPP modeling language. I think you all have been working with F prime and FPP quite a bit. So I kind of moved forward through that section quite expediently because I think you've seen these concepts before. But now is design patterns. This is the big part of the F prime portion of the talk, which is talk to talk about what design patterns do we use to take, you know, an attempt to resolve some of the things we talked about before. How do we break apart execution contexts so we're not bogging down high priority threads? How do we deal with timeliness? How do we manage some of these other design considerations in the system? That all comes into play when we use or rather reuse um, design patterns because these are standard ways to work with and resolve some of these design considerations. So my first and favorite design pattern of all is the adapter pattern. I've also heard it called the bridge pattern. It's the idea that you have one piece of software on the left that has to work with one piece of software on the right and the interfaces don't match. Why? Because they were designed for different use cases. So what do you do? You design a glue software that maps the interface on the left to the interface on the right and makes the two work together. It's fantastic. I use this in just about all the software engineering I do. It's adapters or bridges that link one side to the other. In F prime, we do this via components. We write an adapter component that links something else into F prime. This is done in just about every F prime project that is of a certain size or larger, where they're like, we have this external library that we have to work with, or this vendor has supplied this library that works our hardware for us. How do we use it in F prime? Well, you design a good, clean F prime interface and uh, for that system, and then you build a component that has a public interface, that is its list of ports, is the one you designed, and has an internal interface that interacts with the vendor supplied code or the other team supplied code or the 20 year old library that you have to work with. And it bridges or adapts that for use in F prime. It's done by writing a component that bridges functionality and it specifically adapts or adds concurrently concurrency and timeliness considerations, right? If your vendor supplied code is threadless, but you need this thing to operate on a thread, your adapter component is probably active supplying a thread. If your external library has threads, your adapter component is probably making sure that it has queued messaging so that those threads don't inadvertently, you know, corrupt some other piece of shared data in the system. In this way, we can adapt external entities, external bits of code into F prime and build in the necessary commands, events, telemetry, concurrency handling, timeliness inside this component that bridges the left side to the right side. Again, this is my favorite pattern because I use it in all software engineering because you always have some bit of code that it would be nice to reuse if only it looked a little different. That's what the adapter pattern is for. Rate groups. Rate groups are a close second in terms of favorite design patterns. In fact, I think every one of these design patterns is a favorite of mine. Rate group patterns are the idea that sometimes you need to do things on a clock or meet certain de uh, uh, deadlines or timeliness schedules. In F prime, we have components that tick away at a set rate. So for example, you might have a 10 Hertz component that just says to a set of other components, do something. And it says that message, the do something message at a fixed rate. This way we can get a simple way of dealing with timeliness, right? If you need to do an action to keep your spacecraft healthy at 10 Hertz, well, you connect your component to the 10 Hertz rate group and have it handle that message at 10 Hertz, guess what? Now you have timeliness. You have a clock that ticks away at 10 Hertz. You have a component that dispatches that clock at 10 Hertz. And now a set of components can do something at 10 Hertz. It's, it saves you the trouble of putting that clock, that 10 Hertz clock inside every component and trying to run them all on high priority threads but rather you say, hey, I've got a 10 Hertz rate group that runs at as the highest 
priority thing in the system and it dispatches a message at 10 hertz. And if those messages need to be processed exactly at 10 hertz, you make them synchronous messages that is synchronous port calls and suddenly they're ticking away at 10 hertz. It gives you an easy way of encapsulating these segments of time that have to reoccur. So I put on this slide a 10 hertz rate group. That we typically use something quite fast like 10 hertz to do control of the spacecraft. And then I've shown you a one hertz driver, which operates at once a second. And this is typically downlinking telemetry. We say, all right, send all your telemetry down at one hertz so that we're not getting overloaded with telemetry. And that's you know, still somewhat timely, but recurs at a slower rate. You do need to make sure to understand your concurrency model, because as I said, if component two here on the list is an active component and has a queue, there will be jitter in that queue message. Whereas if your components are synchronous, there won't be jitter, but they will slow down the overall execution of the 10 hertz rate group. My favorite pattern for this is to have a passive rate group that's operating at 10 hertz and connected to a bunch of passive calls, whether they be synchronous calls or um, uh, passive components in general. And then I can look at the timeliness of the array group and say, do I get through all the executions, all those synchronous steps within a 10 Hertz clock? If so, I'm operating well enough that I can meet this 10 Hertz deadline. If not, then I got to slim down my rig group a little bit because it takes more time to execute than I have in a 10 hertz cycle. That means I might have to shuffle some components to a slower rig group or remove some dead, uh, deadlines or, or timeliness concerns, or I might have to get a faster processor. It depends on, on, on the system, but at least I know I execute there. If I have a bunch of active components on this rig group that are queued, I don't really know if I'm completing before the 10 hertz cycle, because again, I've got messages sitting in queues waiting to be processed. You also must take care to make sure that the rate group doesn't slip, because if the rate group slips, it's suddenly not meeting its deadlines anymore. But regardless, the rate group pattern gives you the mechanism to understand and balance these concerns, rather than just trying to do it on a component by component basis. Hub pattern. Hub pattern is another one of my favorites, and it's the idea that you can have a component that serializes F prime constructs onto a wire to be unwrapped somewhere else. So the typical use case is you want an F prime system that operates on two nodes, that is two processors or two different spacecraft, maybe not two different spacecraft, but you know, two processors, two coprocessors on a spacecraft we see quite often. And you want a command dispatcher on one of those CPUs. And on the other CPU, you don't want to run a command dispatcher because why would you have two commanding units on the same platform? And so what the hub pattern does is it allows you to say, put something like a command dispatcher on one of the nodes and then route port calls from that command uh, dispatcher onto a wire that is serialize the calls onto a wire, send them across some barrier like an address space barrier or a UART uh, interface or an ethernet interface, and then unwind them on the remote side and dispatch them there. That way you can have remote components on one side of the hub that work with components on the left side of the hub. And this allows for inter-process communication or inter-CPU communication, or maybe even inter-spacecraft communication if you wanted, while still having a single uh, uh, like macro F prime architecture. Manage your worker pattern. This is another good pattern, and it's the idea of delegating slow work to a worker. We've seen this in thread workers and all sorts of other things in computer science in general, and F prime supports this pattern. The canonical example of this is that you have a manager that, say, wants to open up a file, and you have a file worker that will go off and read that file from disk and report back when it's done. It's a way of decoupling long tasks like working with files or doing something in the background um, from the manager piece, which needs to be up and responsive to things like the command dispatcher, the active logger, et cetera. Those pieces of the system that operate in that middle tier still want you responding in a timely fashion. Um, and you don't want something like file interactions or long running tasks to slow you down. So how do you do this? You decouple it into a manager that, that interacts with commanding and all of that from a worker that runs on the background. Specifically, 
That worker will respond back when its work is complete. Only the manager communicates with the worker. That is, your worker should not communicate to anything else in the system except the manager. Why? Because if it does, then you're bridging that coupling to that slow running task to whatever else it's interacting with. The idea is the manager provides a call, call back pattern so as to decouple itself and it handles the external interface to that worker. And it parallels the worker thread pattern that we've seen in computer science, where you spin off a slow task on a worker thread and get a call back when it's finished. This is the F primeization of that particular pattern. All right. That was a quick run through some design patterns that we use quite often in F prime. There are many, many, many more, but those were some of the common ones that I see that specifically work to breaking down some of these things like timeliness or um, what else do we break down? Bridging um, patterns, et cetera. And um, yeah, sorry. Uh, so that's how we, uh, that's some of the commonly used design patterns. Like I said, there are many more, but those are the ones I see quite often in just about every uh, system of a substantial size. So I now think it's time for questions. Yes? Yes. Uh, right. I noticed that you did not say the manager worker pattern was a favorite of yours. Uh, any any particular reason? Yeah, it's not a favorite of mine because it's a favorite of Kevin's and I'm not going to steal. <laughs> Kevin is another okay. guy on my team and he's the one who, who I saw first adapt the manager your worker pattern to break off file system operations so that they didn't slow down the rest of the system. And so I don't claim that one as, as a favorite because really that is Kevin, uh, one of Kevin's favorites. And I don't want to steal his thunder. Okay, Kevin, it's your thunder. No, no stealing. Uh, right. th this is not so much a question, but I wanted to ask if you had any, if you had an anecdote that a, was about Ginny or another system that you've worked on that ha uh, was specific to some of the information that you've conveyed today, the patterns, the, the timeliness, the concurrency, data organization, some kind of real world applied uh, version of this information. Sure. So um, let's start backwards because I'm thinking about patterns. I mentioned that uh, the file worker pattern was uh, one of Kevin's favorites. I don't know if it's actually one of his favorites, but the system we were working on was um, a, you've heard of Lunar Flashlight, perhaps it's going off to the moon. We were working on some of the flight software there and uh, file system operations were slowing down the execution of the rest of the flight software and were affecting the timeliness of some of those mid-tier and deadline oriented tasks at high tier in terms of priority. So breaking off file operations into the worker pattern decoupled that because suddenly instead of saying, open a file, wait for it to finish process file, hey, I'm done. Now you say, hey, start file processing, go off, do something else. The worker is sitting there reading the file from disk. And then when it's ready, it calls back to the governing manager component and says, hey, I've got your data ready. Now the, the manager can do its work. See how that broke off that piece so that it's not part of the synchronous execution, but it's happening in a background task and calling back when it's finished to continue the operation later. Make sense? And so there right away, we see basically my whole presentation. We saw we broke down the, the system into two components, a manager and a worker, so as to meet a the timeliness concern of the system because we had a thread execution model that originally did not work, but by breaking it into two threads, one of which runs in a background uh, task, we've solved the problem in the system. Does that make sense? It another did, great, thank you. It, uh, another great example that I have is Ingenuity. It actually uses the hub pattern internally. It has two processors, one to spin the blades and one to talk to the ground and sequencing and imaging and all of that. It uses a hub bridge between the two sides. Um, why? Because we wanted one F prime deployment to represent what Ingenuity was doing, but we needed two processors for the two dedicated tasks of the system. So it uses a hub pattern to make it look like one unified F prime system, although it's running on 
technically three CPUs, one primary CPU and two redundant flight controllers. But only one command dispatcher. Only one command dispatcher. And it dispatches commands uh, through the uh, hub. Actually, I, I think technically we have a translation component that translates commands to port calls and then dispatches those over the hub. But on another project called OWLS, we did a hub pattern where the commands themselves were just sent through the hub and back. And so we were able to prove that pattern works as well. And so the hub pattern is incredibly powerful if you want to branch out. In fact, on OWLS, we didn't have three computers in one system. We had three dedicated hosts on the network that the hub made look like a single unified system, even though there were three separate computers. And it was because it was a ground task. So we were doing research and it was easier to have two Linux boxes sitting on the network than it was to build custom hardware with two chips on it. But it shows that the hub pattern can straddle pretty much any gap, as long as you put enough uh, engineering on either side to make sure that your messages are coming across without corruption. Does that help a little bit? Do you want more it, examples or? Uh, uh, no, it did absolutely answered my question. Uh, Noah, you know, take it away, sir. I believe one of the students did have a question. Yes, I do have a question. And thank you for the talk. This has been very informative and very helpful. Um, sure. I'm trying to make sure I understand the adapter pattern. So I'm thinking about um, a situation when we're like trying to implement maybe a secure channel. So uh, where it'd be kind of a security risk to try to implement that from scratch. So we would need to implement, get a like well-known library, um, for example, to, uh, to make sure that exists. So with the adapter pattern, be appropriate for, for transporting that library into the satellite context? Yes. So when you say the word library, I say adapter pattern. A good example of where I've used the adapter pattern before is I have a, some chunk of hardware out there that I want to interact with, but it's complicated, like a big fancy camera or some fancy motor thing, right? And so my vendor that built the hardware says, here's a Linux library or here's a embedded systems library that controls this thing, that gives you all the functions you need to control it. That's great. The vendor wrote a bunch of code, tested it, delivered it, so I don't have to rewrite that code. However, it's not F prime code because the vendor doesn't know about F prime or knows about F prime, but doesn't want to make every single user of theirs use F prime. That's when I deploy my adapter pattern. I write a component that translates from the F prime running system to the library and back again. So in your context, you're talking about using a, I'm guessing, cryptographic library. I, you said secure channel. And so my mind went to cryptographic library, but I'm just kind of guessing here. And you don't want to re-implement it entirely in F prime because that's a security risk because now you're re-implementing code that you'd then have to test for your security. And so I would say, yeah, I would create an F prime bridge that takes that secure channel library that implements it and exposes it with an F prime style interface, ports and commands to the rest of your system. That way your system can use this secure channel and this adapter component just maps between the two protocols. Um, that's my guess, not having a ton of details on what it is specifically that you're attempting to use. That answers my question completely. Thank you so much. That makes a lot of sense. Cool. Any other questions? Any of the students have any other questions that they want to ask? I personally don't, don't have any specific questions, but I have been working with F prime since January of 2022 as of now, which I cannot believe that it's been that long. <laughs> but um, definitely thank you for the um, seminar today. Um, I'll def we'll definitely be adding it to the um, list of like required materials that students have to view when I'm being onboarded onto the flight software team because a lot of what we went over today is stuff that I've had to, on, like I've, I've had to teach it multiple times throughout the semester, just because um, topics getting into memory management and thread concurrency are very complex. Yeah, I can understand. I see a question has just come in right. uh, via the chat. So 
I'm going to hit the answer live button, I think. Um, I have a I'm just going to read it out. Um, I have a question regarding off nominals. When an error does occur, such as it, such as low power, I would assume that you would want to add a way that the error is automatically handled within the software. Is that always wise to do? Yes, but let me qualify that a little bit. So when an off nominal issue occurs, you do not want a system crash. That's the last thing you want to do. And so there are certain types of errors that it's hard to avoid a crash, like out of memory, which is why we did all of that work to push memory allocation to the beginning to reduce the risk of that error. But when the software crashes, your spacecraft is left in an unknown state and you have no control. So that unknown state could be, you know, run the engines until they explode and you don't have control to say no stop. And so anytime an off nominal condition occurs, you should do your due diligence to trap it and handle it. And so what does that handling look like? If it's component level problem, like, hey, I didn't open up this resource, what do I do? Well, you could probably handle that at the component level by saying, Resource isn't available, retry at the next time you try to, you know, interact with this component. This is just a for instance, or, you know, it depends on your use case. If it's a system level problem, you route that to a, um, typically you route that to a fault handler. That is a component who, whose design is to specify what are the the handlings you do in terms of system level faults. So let's say uh, you have a fault where the thrusters will not shut off for your spacecraft. You need to route that fault to this uh, handler, which will then walk through the process of resolving that fault, whatever your project defines it to be. But you want to route it because it's a system level concern. You know, navigation is now moving forward uh, without thruster control. How do you handle it? Now, I think part of your question moves into the world of automatically handling it. And the off nominal uh, handler is somewhat automated. But quite often on projects, the off nominal handler, that fault handler that we've been talking about, its response is to just say, go to safe mode, wait for the ground to command you. And so that isn't really a fully automated response. It's not trying to resolve the issue. It's just trying to deescalate the issue and then wait till somebody gives it new information, right? So safe mode typically shuts off all outputs of the spacecraft turns on telecom and, and waits or, or whatever your project needs it to do to be safe. Thus, we're not really automatically handling the fault. And so in terms of what faults can you handle automatically to continue the operation of the spacecraft, that really depends back on your system level requirements. What faults are you required to withstand versus what faults are you allowed to sit and wait for ground control? Some projects have a, a life cycle of like two days. So you want to handle most of your faults automatically because you don't have the time to get the ground in the loop to resolve an issue to con you know, continue moving forward. Some projects have the luxury of operating for six months, eight months at a time. They have the luxury of just waiting for ground to get in the loop and trying to design an automated uh, response to an off nominal condition is more risk than they're worth. So your project needs to do this trade and say, what faults must we survive in being able to keep doing daily operations because we you know, have a project level concern that waiting for ground in the loop is gonna cause us to run out of you know, mission life or what faults must we wait for the ground in the loop because we just don't know what to do until we see what the fault looks like. Does that answer your question? Or should I elaborate there a little bit? Okay, great. I kind of wanted to to ask kind of a, a backup or follow up question there, um, and th there may not be a clean answer to this. When when we teach radiation tolerant electronics design and, and avionics design, including the software we are teaching that a fault tolerance system makes dedicated use of fault avoidance, which is, it's gonna be your, your shielding, um, any mm -hmm. kind of common insulator. This is generally electrical or structural um, materials. 
default masking, this is the error correction codes that uh, are, are employed by memory management unit, yeah. uh, detection of compromised system operation, which is where F prime might get involved, containment of error propagation, which is also where F prime might get involved, and recovery to normal system operations. So there's the fault avoidance, fault masking, detection of compromised system operation, containment of error propagation, and recovery to normal system operations. Where do you see F prime strengths or or abilities or, or capabilities lying for detection of compromised system operation and containment of error propagation? So the idea behind detecting the system is to um, look for conditions where a fault might have occurred and flag it, right? So that it doesn't just kind of, how would we say, undetected float through your system and break stuff. Now, a lot of that detection typically happens in hardware, right? You're looking for bit flips, so you're doing memory uh, checks. Some of it happens at the operating system with the operating system uh, consistency checks and stuff like that. Um, where F prime gets involved is the asserts. F prime has a robust assert system where you can assert on known um, conditions, expected preconditions for function calls, et cetera. And so this allows us to detect most of the time software faults, where I wrote software that I expected it to behave one way, and it doesn't actually behave that way because of either some off nominal condition on the spacecraft, or you walk down a software branch that I just didn't test enough. And F prime collects those asserts and then hands them off to the assert handler, which then you can either route to a fatal you know, turn the assault, the assert into a fatal or route it to say a um, fault handler like we've been talking about. And so how does, how do we embrace F prime strengths with uh, fault detection put in asserts in your functions that you write in your port handlers that you write all of them put in asserts, those arguments that come in assert that they're within the range you expect. If your, you know, thruster, um, uh, if your argument to your port is supposed to be in the range 30 to 40, right? The first line of that uh, handler for that port call should say assert input value is greater than 30 and less than 40, right? Assert that it's within that range. Why? Because you don't know what could have happened. Memory corruption, somebody entered a wrong value on the ground, who knows what. But you want to make sure that you don't pass a value that is outside the expected range to some code later on down the line. Otherwise, that code could do something unexpected, and now your fault isn't detected, nor is it contained. It's now running downhill. Asserts operate on the detection of faults, but they also contain that fault because they don't let it propagate uh, through the system without being detected. So asserts are essential to this kind of operation. You could also put in if statements. It's best not to assert on ground input values or hardware input values because hardware can do strange things as can ground commanders. So you probably would use if statements and if checks and asserts in different contexts, but still you are checking those input values. Another place to use an assert is the output of a calculation. You call a function that you know does some division, assert to make sure that the inputs to that function and the outputs of that function are within the range you expect. This is one of the reasons why a lot of uh, flight quality code and, and uh, static checking for flight code is looking for assert density because those asserts prevent these errors from rolling downhill because if something goes wrong, you'll see it, you'll assert on it, and the software will stop and handle that assert in that case. So that's part of the answer to your question. It, it talks about a little bit of, a, um, give me a moment, it talks a little bit about fault detection and fault containment. Another important property of F prime is the component architecture. This goes to containing faults as well, because faults occur within a component and your interface to other components is very clearly defined. And so if a fault is going to happen in this component, you have a clearly defined interface with another component, which naturally prevents that fault 
from rolling downhill, especially if you're asserting on your inputs. That way you can contain the fault within a component. And optionally, if it's a system level fault, like I've been saying, hand it off to a component that manages the faults for the system. Does that make so, sense? Yeah, so if you have a manager worker pattern and you put the asserts on the manager, you're not gonna put the same asserts on the worker because of F prime's built-in architecture, or would you do it on both for safe, just for an extra layer of safety? I do it on both. Okay. Because That's good to know. Most of the time, my component ports are receiving port calls from somebody else. And I want to make sure that whatever is handed to me is correct. Why? There are two conditions. One, I probably wrote the other component and I should not trust myself, both my past self and my future self, to not do something silly. And two, somebody on some other project somewhere down the line, probably 10 years from now, will come in, see my component, say, I'm going to use that and drop it in an unknown context. If it's well written with good assertions, then they will know right away if they've used it in a context for which it was not intended and they'll correct their behavior. Um, another good architectural principle about F prime is we have our input arguments are strongly typed, right? They're floats or they're integers or they're these complex types. Regardless, that gives you some level of safety already because it's strongly typed. So I don't have to uh, assert that an integer coming into my program, if I can handle the whole range of that integer, is not a float because I know that it's strongly typed. So therefore, I know it's not going to be a float. And so a lot of components that you see in core F prime don't have a lot of asserting around their arguments. It's not because asserts aren't necessary uh, or, or aren't valuable, but it's because the component will handle the entire range of input and therefore the assert would be assert true or, or it would collapse to assert true because of the strongly typed nature of asserts. So you should be, or sorry, of the input arguments. So therefore, you should be using your asserts to check when your range does not match the natural range of the data type that you've been provided. And also use asserts to check um, other assumptions. Another great place to use asserts is on member variables. And you'll see that a lot in F prime, assert not null. Because you set it at null at construction time, then at initialization time, you want to allocate some resource and set it to not null. And then the rest of the program, every time you're making a call, you're asserting not null to prove that this component was initialized when you expect. And that case of errors happens all the time because somebody like me forgets to call dot init in the topology and suddenly the component isn't initialized and that assert saved you from a null pointer dereference, which would cascade into a seg fault and be much harder to debug. Uh, have I answered your question? Do you want me to elaborate? You answered thoroughly. Um, I my, my only follow-up question here, and this will be the last one before I shut up, is are there any asserts that you would recommend go on every component regardless of purpose just by virtue of their utility always assert when using a pointer that it is non-null that's the number one assert i use all the time the, I try to avoid pointers wherever possible because pointers are inherently dangerous because you're leaving the um the primary assumption in software is that you've set a value to a variable when you're going to use it. This happens at the compiler level, even if you define it without an initial uh, value, which you should never do. The compiler will assign one. On Mac, it assigns zero. On Linux, it assigns whatever is sitting in that memory block already, but it has a value. Pointers step away from that in that they can contain this special pointer value null and not be assigned to anything. That makes them inherently dangerous. And so when I'm using pointers in the system, at every function interface that takes that pointer, at every handler that dereferences that pointer because it's a, it's a member of, of the class I'm using, I assert that it is not null before I touch it. Doesn't matter if I know that some function above me called me and had already done that assert. I redo that assert because again, Pointers aren't dangerous and null dereferences sometimes are captured by the software and in some embedded systems just result in random walks through memory. You don't want that. 
So therefore assert on your pointers. Give me a second. I'll try to think if I can come up with anything else. Another if check, I don't always make this an assert, but another if check that I like to do quite often is if port connected, because we kind of assume a lot that in F prime ports are connected, but those can result in assertion crashes because somebody forgot to connect a port. So if in any context it is valid to not have a port connected, you should use if connected before calling that output port. I do this all the time with status ports. If port connected, send status. Why? Because some people don't care about that status. They don't bother to wire up the port. And I don't want the system to crash simply because that port doesn't get connected. This happens a lot in F prime core components because F prime core components are reused in a lot of different contexts. And some people might want those statuses. Some people might not want that feature. And so they don't connect the port. And so I have to be very pedantic about that check. In projects like yours, you may or may not have this problem. You may be delivering software for a bus and you know that it must be connected. And so you just assume it's connected, but also you're kind of a collaboration of different projects trying to use the same bus. And so you may run into this where people wanna reuse it, but not connect certain ports in their topology. And so being aware when ports are allowed to not be connected and checking, um, that they're connected before you use them is in the same category of things that I keep in mind all the time. Even though it's not strictly an assert, it helps avoid an overly strict assert in some contexts. Um, for things like arrays, when you're dealing with arrays or structures, uh, especially member arrays, you want to make sure that they, uh, to assert that they were um, initialized before you use them because arrays aren't by default initialized, right? They're just a block of memory. So, you know, checking that they're within valid range is always good. The way we construct our architectures with uh, components at global space and component references, you don't have to assert that components have been constructed because you're guaranteed, given that it's a global component that is passed by reference, that it will always have been constructed before you have the option to use it. So that one is typically safe. Thinking out loud here a little bit. Yeah, most of the time, the big one I use is asserting not null on pointers. And then the second one is asserting that my arguments are within the valid range. Anytime your argument may take on a range that is smaller than the type uh, that it's specified as. So quite often that results in assert greater than zero, right? Because often we have an integer that or a float that should never be negative. And so the most common one there is assert greater, greater than or zero or greater than equal to zero. Those are the, the few to keep in mind. Uh, yeah, I kind of rambled a little bit there. Your your thoughts are more valuable than our thoughts. Your like as as many as you you want to convey. Um, that that concludes my questions. Uh, Noah, do you have anything? No, I don't have any. I don't have any follow ups. I mean, I felt like that was very well worded. I did too, Michael. Thank you very much for your time. Um, yeah, thank course. you for the thought and effort that you put into this presentation. I'm absolutely positive that this is going to be incredibly helpful for uh, years to come. Thank you to Noah and Dr. Chin for being here uh, to 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 listen to what Michael has to say, and um, I just really appreciate everyone's time. So uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas. Would you like to to give a closing I, thought? I was just going to say. Uh, a lot of good info, Michael. I took notes. Uh, thank you very much for taking time out of your day. And the, the one thing I would say as a parting thought is take what I've said with a grain of salt. I've done my best to lay out the strategies that I and people around me here use to design software and some of the ways we think about things. But that doesn't mean we are the only opinion on a lot of these subjects. So, you know, use your head, use your intuition, apply what I've presented where it's useful and come up with better strategies where it's not useful. Thank you all for your time and best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. And Unrelated to the um, seminar, I did want to ask about the F prime working group meeting time. If you happen to know when that schedule is.
I'll go ahead and turn off the recording. Yes. I just